Well, hello, With Gratitude Matt listeners. My name is Matt Moran, and I'm the host for the With Gratitude Matt show. Our goal with the show is to inspire our listeners to practice gratitude regardless of how powerful the storm is. I've learned oftentimes in the most difficult periods when we're right in the middle of a storm, gratitude is most important. But I found also that gratitude is like a muscle. The more that you use it, the stronger it becomes. Today's guest is Mary Morantz, a a law school graduate from Yale University and the first in her immediate family to go to college. She is the author of the book, Dirt, about growing up in West Virginia and the host of her own podcast show, The Mary Morantz Show, which debuted in the iTunes Top 200 Podcast List. More recently, she wrote the book, Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots. Her writing has been featured by Business Insider, Thrive Global, and MSN. So it gives me great gratitude to welcome Mary Morantz to the show. Welcome to the show, Mary. Oh, Matt, thank you so much for having me. And I was just realizing we have this thing going on where we're both double M's in our names and our last names are pretty similar. I feel like this is already a good start. Well, when I when I first heard you on uh, John O'Leary's podcast, Live Inspired, apologize for that. Uh, <laughs> girls are coming home from school right now. But uh, when I heard you on John's podcast, I did recognize the similarity behind our, our last names. You know, you were a guest on John's show and I have to just, um, I pay tribute to John. I, John mm. has been an inspiration to me. He's got his Live Inspired podcast and when you were a guest on his show, he you guys talked quite a bit about growing up in Nicholas County, West Virginia. For those of for those of our listeners that don't know uh, what it's like to grow up in the mountains of West Virginia, could you share with our audience what it was like for you and a, a little bit about Nicholas County? Yeah, I would love to. You know, I, as you were even like asking that question, the first thought that went through my head is both from a combination of when I grew up and where I grew up, which was in the 80s in rural West Virginia on the top of a mountain, I'm not sure there will ever be another generation that grows up the way that I did. Um, you know, it was it was sort of, uh, we were kind of like feral cats, <laughs> you know, in the 80s. I think that's sort of generally true of 80s kids. And then you add in uh, the mountain and the rural part. And so we would be out the door 6 a.m., you know, sunrise, and in the summer, you're not back till like 9 or 10 at night. And we would be down in the woods, layer, you know, log road after log road, cutting down the side of the mountain. Each different level we were treat was like a different level in Mario World or something like that. And so, you know, we would ride our bikes like 18 miles round trip, you know, three miles to the airport, back, there and back, there and back, you know, and that was just, that was our day, you know, and get popsicles and whatever. And there is something very like Goonies, uh, nostalgic about that kind of an existence. But like many things that are beautiful and nostalgic, there can also be a, a hard element to it, a, a muddy element to it. And so the shortest version is I grew up in a single wide trailer in uh, on top of a mountain called Fenwick Mountain in West Virginia. My dad's a logger. My mom and grandma cleaned houses. And I, my, my, you know, I talk a little bit in the episode with John, my mom left when I was little. It was me and my dad for, from like nine years old on. And in many ways I grew up between the, all of those things, both already just being left to our own devices and then having to grow up a little too quickly. I sort of grew up before my time, I would say. And I was an only child. And then that also tends to have you grow up before your time, I think, or at least you relate to adults more. And so, um, yeah, it was just sort of me and my dad, my grandma Goldie next door, his mom, and a bunch of stray animals <laughs> in and out of the yard. So I learned a little bit more about Goldie in, in, in the book, Dirt. Yeah. Um, I think our audience would, would love to get to know her a little bit better. She had a yeah. profound influence on you in many ways. Um, what, what can you share with uh, our listening audience about your grandmother, Goldie? Yeah, I always say... Goldie was, you know, five foot two and a towering force in our family tree. She was just pure one part firecracker, one part sassafras. You know, she, she, she was famous for saying, 
uh, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And in case you didn't know it, I'm the dang Roman. <laughs> and I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And so she was, Goldie was a complicated character because she, I mean, I say character, but she's obviously a real person. Um, and I mean character and like she's a character. Um, she grew up one of 13 and she was the oldest daughter. And she grew up in a very hard and very hard childhood. Her her own father was an alcoholic and, and very violent. And with that many kids, she just didn't get a lot of attention unless she was sick. And, you know, she she basically was out on her own to take care of herself at a very young age. And when Goldie was a younger woman, I want to say probably like 16, 17, um, she actually was bitten by a dog on the on the hand and it nearly bit all the way through and it left this like shiny scar both on her palm and the top of her hand. And that's where some of this complicated comes in because she could be simultaneously incredibly kind. She loved, loved, loved me as her granddaughter. Um, I was the only grandchild for most of my life. And she could also have this like callous side to her, this, this distant side to her, this cruel side to her to a certain extent where she would have animals, but they would be chained up outside and never, you know, got pats or never got love and they would get just whatever scraps she threw out. She kept them for like protection, but she did not, she did not love them. She did not like them. And uh, a lot of them would sort of pass away these, these horrible deaths because there was just, or just lived these broken hearted lives. I feel like because they weren't, you know, never fully loved or connected to with her and so you know I, we would all sort of get glimpses of that I would say she could slam a door like nobody's business but I think something happens when you revisit stories like that as an adult and it's this empathy that takes root I could both simultaneously see my grandmother for this grandmother aged figure she was and also the little girl that she was who was probably just fighting for any kind of attention so yeah, that was a very long way of saying it was super important to me in painting these characters, these real life characters in this book, for it to never feel black and white or two dimensional or caricatures or to tell the reader what they expect to hear, that there is good and there's hard and there's beautiful and there's broken and all of us, myself included. Myself included as well. Yeah. And I think what's beautiful is the profound impact she's had on you. Uh, I know... Um, you know, you have strong faith yourself just through listening to you, reading some of your books. Um, she had a profound impact on that. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what you remember about uh, your your early days uh, in, in, in going to church with her on Sundays and, mm -hmm. and what impact that might have had on the relationship that you have with God today. You know, it, it's interesting because I kind of, I'm, I talk about in dirt six out of seven days, we would be like in muddy jeans and t-shirts out in the yard, her included. And then on the seventh day, we would put on the fanciest <laughs> pink frilly outfits you can imagine. I was always in some pink poofy dress and a hat and little gloves. And she would always wear her like pink uh, church lady suit with a lace ruffle collar and her white shoulders perfume, um, red lipstick. And, and we would go to Sunday school. It was very important to her that I would go to Sunday school. My dad would not go. Sunday was his only day off. And so he would just be on the couch all day from like 6 a.m. onward. Um, and it, But it was very important to her that I went with her. And it's it's interesting because I grew up in the church in that respect. I grew up going to church in that respect. But it is nothing like the faith that I know now. So what I mean by that is it, it felt more like a a history lesson almost like we would spend an inordinate amount of time talking about Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I thought that guy was going to come up a lot more in my adult life than he has. And it wasn't until I was probably like 20, 2012, I started going to some Christian conferences. That was the first time I learned about joy. That was the first time I learned about worship or quiet time or how to study scripture, how to have a, a living, breathing uh, relationship uh, with God's word or just even spend time with him. And in and, and that respect, I, I should, I should say that I feel like I always knew how to spend time with him. It's just that for a lot of years, I felt like that was my earliest understanding of spending time with God is that he would just come down to the window when I was a little girl and talk to me. Like, that's what it felt like. Not really, but like, that's, you know, kind of how I imagined it. Um, or I would find him outside in the yard or, you know, in the sunshine. I, there's a line in dirt that says he was color and freedom and fire and dirt. 
And then I feel like I started going to church and it became about sitting in the pews or reading, you know, singing the right hymns or talking about the right historical figures. And it felt like there was this distance, like you have to check the right boxes or jump through the right hoops. And and there was a long time where I kind of went a, like the long way around from God only to find myself back now in this place of draw down close enough to the window to leave fog marks on the glass. Let me sit cross-legged on the floor with you close enough where you could see every flaw, but instead you count every hair on my head. Um, one of my favorite lines in Dirt, he it says, you know, I, I, he's close enough where he could play the hand slap game if he wanted to, but instead he puts a cool hand on my forehead and at once all the pain subsides. That's okay, he says to me, you just forgot who you were there for a little while. So it's it's weird because it was important to her that I was in church and, and I'm grateful for that, but it was not where the truest form of my faith was forged. That is so beautiful. And as I hear you talk about that, I feel he, capital H-E, is like so present right here mm. with us. Yeah. And, you know, uh, being raised Catholic, going to the church, I think so... There's a lot of similarities between what you talked about and checking the boxes, doing X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And what I've found through what I'm going through myself is the more your eyes are open, the more he's present. And uh, I, I just appreciate the the color on that. Uh, yeah. And you had, you had a beautiful grandmother and uh, it's just a remarkable uh, picture that you paint for us. Your father as well, had a very profound impact on you. I have two girls myself, um, and I hope I can have the impact on them that 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 your father had on you. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, at nine years old, your mother left, so it, it, a lot more was left to him, um, and he would refer to you as the kid. Maybe how did that, yeah. that, that um, name come about? And uh, mm. maybe share a little bit about your father as well. Yeah. So I mean, like I mentioned, you know, he, he was never the one who wanted kids. My mom was the one who pushed to have kids and then ironically was the one who left. Um, and there's this great story where, I mean, like to the point that when she was pregnant with me and, and had a belly, she would ask him to, you know, oh, she's kicking, feel my belly. And he didn't, he didn't want to. Um, he was, he, he would later tell me it's not that he never wanted kids. He just wanted them to wait until they could get some money saved up and be a little more established because she was 20 going on 21. She's pretty young, pretty young for that step. And, um, so she, she goes to have me in there in the hospital and, um, she was going to name me. She had like, she said, what do you want to name her? I said, oh, I don't care. Um, she was going to name me. She'd even like put it on the birth certificate or was about to Renata Ann, R E N A T A Ann. And my dad apparently came back and said, that sounds like Ramada Inn. <laughs> so uh, he was the one who actually named me Mary after his great aunt and, and Ellen after his grandmother. And I guess, well, his aunt, my great aunt, and Ellen after his grandmother. And um, the story is Goldie and my dad were in the hallway and the, there was the little room with the plastic, you know, bassinets and all the babies. And they could hear them screaming from the hallway and they were walking down to see me and you know, he said to Goldie, he said, oh, listen to that. But that kid of mine, that kid of mine is the one leading the pack, screaming her lungs out. Goldie said, you don't know that. And so when they rounded the corner, the truth, at least according to Goldie, <laughs> who knows, uh, was that they rounded the corner and I was the only baby not screaming my head off. I was just looking around like, what's wrong with all of you? And in that moment, I went from that kid, little, little lowercase to the kid, yeah. capital. And so he just called me that my whole life. Kid, 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 stir the kid. What's the kid up to today? Until I went to law school. And that was when I finally, he finally, for the first time, called me Mary. That's cool. That's cool. You know, so yeah. uh, early on, you know, you got a dad who um, apparently you know, didn't really want, wasn't excited about being a father. Um, but he, he did, he did some things from an academic perspective early on for you that did in fact, lead to you being labeled as being gifted, bright, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even considering moving you up a grade and whatnot, what, what, what was he doing for you even before you got to kindergarten to mm -hmm. make sure that you, you had every opportunity from an academic perspective? Yeah, definitely. Well, one thing I do want to make <clears throat> very clear is that from that moment on, when he saw me in the hospital, then he was all in on being a dad. So I did not 
experience in my life, him not wanting me. It was all before <laughs> before yep. me. Yep. Um, and so one of the things I think that's really important to know is that the trailer I grew up in, they parked it on the back half of Goldie's yard um, to, as a temporary fix that never got changed. And so I'm growing up and my dad went to work in the woods when he was 12. He had, he had a very hard life very early and so here I am, I'm growing up in the same yard he grew up in. I'm going to the same Sunday school that Goldie had made him go to as well when he was little. And I'm about to start the same elementary called New Hope Elementary that he had gone to. And he was very quickly starting to see this pattern emerge, this trajectory I was on, that if something did not intervene, my life was going to end up hard like his was. And when he had gone to kindergarten at New Hope, he had felt very unprepared by his parents. And somebody, like the teacher had asked him a question one of those first few days and he didn't know the answer and the kids all laughed at him. And that is all that it took. This is, this gives me chills every time I think about it. That moment was all that it took to burn into his brain. To this day, he will tell this story as proof that he was nothing but, you know, not cut out to be anything but a quote, dumb old logger. Like that, that one one time feeling publicly embarrassed for not being prepared. My dad is one of the smartest people you could ever talk to. He can rattle off civil war, uh, you know, facts and dates. And this general, he loves Gettysburg. This general came from this hill and whatever. He could have been a brilliant history professor. Um, but he just had that, this, these moments, you know, they, they can define us. These labels can define us. So for him, it was very important that I be prepared going into kindergarten. So there were these workbooks in the eighties with like, dot matrix printing on the cover these letters and symbols formed a picture that looked like a picture of a little boy and you could get them in reading and math for whatever grade your kid was going into uh was the expectation but i say in the book jr best was never big on expectations and so he started me when i was four doing this and every time i finished a workbook he would just go up a grade to the point that when i started kindergarten the following fall i was in a fifth grade math and a sixth grade reading level and so I go to school and the thing that burns on me, the thing that becomes my label are these teachers going, wow, she's really smart. Wow, she's ahead of the curve. Wow, she's bright. Maybe we should even skip her. You know, I think that we're going to have me skip over third grade to go into fourth. Um, and like it's these words speak life or death. And so for me, those labels, like I say, became a lifeline. It became proof that maybe I was more than where I started. And so that, I think those workbooks become the first domino that falls when you trace it all the way back of how I ultimately end up at Yale for law school. That's beautiful. You know, yeah. in your book, you talk a little bit about it. You talk about like how impactful certain instances can be. And I love the story you told or shared about um, presenting was the night before Christmas when you were mm -hmm. four years old and how you prepared for that in front of this, you know, this big Christmas pageant, a lot of, you know, families, school friends, all there. I can just picture it. Mm -hmm. And you did it perfectly. Mm -hmm. The following year as a five-year-old, you were asked to now do, Twas the night before Jesus comes. And I will say this, I, I, I could, I remember the part in the, in the book, but you did it perfectly as God had that planned out for you. Mm -hmm. But I, I know your father was tough on you as a as a child. Um, how did that night play out in your head? Mm -hmm. and, and what did you learn about God's love for you and how your father loved you unconditionally that evening? Yeah. So first of all, that whole thing that you just described was not my idea. That was that was that was J.R. Best's idea. He got <laughs> he did not want to go to church himself, but he got it in his head that I should stand up in front of the whole community packed into this church for the Christmas pageant and little, you know, four-year-old with Mary Jane shoes and a spotlight on me and re not read, but recite from memory this entire, it was the night before Christmas. And um, we, pra I mean, we practiced over and over and over. He'd have me come sit at the kitchen table and he would, I remember he would put his elbows on the book and the mud in the folds of his flannel would leave marks on the pages. Um, and so if you look at the cover of dirt, the letters are smudged. And that's kind of an homage to that, that, that he, he would leave these smudged fingerprints uh, across my life. And um, the second year, we had to do it again. This time was going to be, it was the, you know, the night before Jesus came. 
And I was just, I didn't want to practice as hard. I didn't want to memorize as hard. And so twice in this whole stanzas of poems, I had to be reminded of the next step. And so after the pageant, the tradition was that all the parents brought one present for the kids to open that night. There's a little tree off to the side. And after it was over, it's like celebration. You could open your present. And so all the kids are off in the corner opening their presents. And I'm sitting on the stage. I can remember this is clear as day. My legs, you know, my feet don't even touch the floor and they're just swinging back and forth. I'm staring down at those like patent leather little black shoes. And my dad comes up. This is the one time a year he would wear a suit unless there was a funeral in this gray suit. And he's kind of like towering over me. And his his big advice, his big requirement both years was don't fidget and don't mess it up. Don't fidget and don't mess it up. And so he comes up to me and he says, you know, kid, why aren't you opening your present? And I said, oh, I, you know, I didn't earn it. I messed up. I messed up. I don't, I didn't, I didn't earn the gift. And he said, you know, he kind of thought about it for a second. And he's like, in my memory, big enough that he's blocking, it's being lit behind from this light that's still on in the back. So he's just this like towering silhouette. Um, and he said, he like walked over and picked up the box and he said, well, I'll tell you what, this gift was not because of what you did. This gift is because your old dad loves you. And I did not of course, think of it this way at the time because I was five. But as a woman looking back on that memory, I think that's a really beautiful picture of our relationship with God. Um, I don't think that God is saying to us, don't fidget it and don't mess it up. But I do think he wants us to work with excellence. And we often mistake working as if working for the Lord as working as if working for his love or for our grace, you know, for his grace for us that we can earn our way into it. And it was just such a beautiful reminder that even, even though he has a plan for us and work for us to do and things he wants us to do well, at the end of the day, the gifts he has for us are not because of anything we could do, but simply because he's a good, good father and he loves us. That is remarkable. That is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I want to move gears to just a bit. My daughter, my youngest daughter loves animals. And prior to pandemic, we did not have any animals. We do have a dog now. You heard him earlier. <laughs> um, you grew up with lots of animals around. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you learned a lot from them. Um, some welcomed, some not. But what did animals in the relationships that you have with those animals teach you just about life and who you are mm -hmm. today? And could you imagine life without pets? Oh, I love this question. I'm not sure if anybody's ever asked me this question. This is good. Um, yeah, I say that we had a steady revolving door of stray animals when I was growing up and none of them met a very happy ending. And, and you'd mentioned some welcome, some unwelcome. The unwelcome ones were referencing more like the mice and the snakes and we would occasionally have roaches and magnet, you know, maggots in the sink. Um, but the dogs and the cats were a different story. I loved all of them. And I was around four when at the New Hope Elementary schoolyard, we found there was a little stray cat that had been abandoned and I snuck him home. And I don't know why to this day I had one of these. I think maybe they handed them out to kids in the eighties, like one of those plastic fire helmets. Maybe it was part of like a, you know, fire safety training. I don't know, but there was a hat and we put the, ki the kitten in the hat and then wrapped, um, I called it my, my Baba. It was like a, a blue gingham robe that was like a blanket. And we snuck this kitten home and we named it Thomas until a year later when she had kittens. <laughs> we forever changed it to Thomasina. Um, and I loved that cat with my whole heart. Uh, and this was probably one of, mm, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to ballpark it, say 30, 35 animals wow. we had at different times. Um, I loved that cat. I remember at one point, because we never took our animals to the vet, she got ear mites in her little ear, you know. Kind of curved in on itself and then just one day she was gone and I to this day don't know what happened to her and every day I would wait for her to come back and she never did and there were other ones that you know would get hit by a car or the neighbors would protect their territory their yards by putting out antifreeze um, to poison them or we would have to drive up Saxman Holler and, and drop off kittens because we couldn't keep them um, and it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. And I have such a huge heart for animals and shelters and, um, you know, just making sure that we're giving back in any way we can there now. And the first time 
that I had an animal as an adult um, is, is a golden retriever named Cooper because um, I saw that they had a golden retriever on Full House and that became like the epitome of the good life to me. And we had Cooper for 12 and a half years. We got him as a puppy and we were there holding him when we said goodbye. And that was heartbreaking. But it also felt um, it felt like a, a, a a break in generational chains. It felt like the, the family tree had been changed because we loved an animal and we cared for an animal. And that animal had every vet trip that it needed um, from start to finish. Wow. Yeah. Our our daughter already knows she wants to be a veterinarian. And I mm-hmm. hope I, I, I hope that that continues. I would love to see it happen. And uh, she's begging us to get another animal. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not quite sure we're going to go down that route just yet yeah yeah what kind yeah. of dog do you have we have a uh it's just a uh it's a little it's a poodle uh, yeah. it's just it's uh yeah it's a uh, little bit loud yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice yeah and he's about he's a little over two years old now just it, not quite two we 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 went into pandemic not real not thinking we were going to get a, a a dog and we did like so yeah. many other people did yeah so, um, you know, you, you go from, you know, the, you were the first in your immediate family to go to, uh, college. You went to West Virginia mm-hmm. university. Uh, I'm sure that was pretty exciting for, for you and, uh, the family, but ultimately you ended up at the best law school, uh, in the country, Yale university law school in New Haven, um, Love to hear a little bit more about him if if the transition to college itself was impactful enough. But I think, you know, talking about the transition to Yale and New Haven, what that experience was like for you. Yeah, I I did. I did my four years undergrad at WVU, West Virginia University. I did a double uh, major BA in political science and philosophy. And I do want to touch on that for a second because I almost did not go. I almost did not apply um, that was the plan. I wanted to go there. They were the only um, school in the state that also had a law school. And at the time, I thought you had to go to your undergrad. This, like if you went to a place for undergrad, you just continued on into law school. I thought you were deciding it all at that stage. I didn't know you could change. Um, and so I'm looking at it. And then I was, I, I was standing in the guidance counselor's office in high school. And I saw a poster on the wall. And it said 22,000 students. And I thought, we, my whole town, if you brought everybody down from the mountains, had about 2,000 people. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, my goodness, if I go there, I will surely be number 22,001, the, the least of these. I, I'm going to fail out. And that sounds like hyperbole or like, oh, you just want somebody to say, no, you'll be fine. But I genuinely thought, surely these kids who are coming from out of state, because it's cheaper for New Jersey kids to go out of state to WVU than it is to go in state oh, to wow. Rutgers. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of kids who come from out of state. Um, you know, I'm from the small town, and I just thought you, there's a correlation where if you start small, you are small. So I genuinely thought I was going to fail out, but I still also really wanted to go to law school. I, you know, would watch. I would put on Goldie's pink suit and watch the People's Court with Judge Wapner uh, and Perry Mason on repeat. And I just, I, I'd always wanted to see that dream through. So, WVU it was, and that becomes this um, transformation, this transition, this um, gateway drug, for lack of a better description. Like I got there. And suddenly all of these borders start to fall away. I join the debate team and we start to travel to all these different places, seeing different schools, like holding our own with these other schools like Navy and Liberty and what have you. And we're studying global politics. I'm studying about the world. And so the world sort of opened up. The borders of West Virginia fell away. And I end up doing a year in England with a Rotary scholarship and then applying to law school. And this is a really interesting pain point in the story because my dad wanted me to get out, but he meant out of our town out of our mountain and Morgantown was like the pinnacle of as far as he wanted me to go and so he was genuinely upset that I was looking at law schools out of state he said if all the talent keeps leaving the state how will you know WVU law schools start to rank higher and so it was a real point of contention and it didn't help that 9-11 had just happened and I to tell him I'm gonna go spend a year in England and so that was kind of that was this this moment that if I hadn't gone there 
as that like acclimation or that transformation, I don't think I would have ever considered applying to you. That's awesome. You know, um, I often talk and my, my dad has said for years, if you compare you're in despair and I believe that like if, when you, if you're comparing yourself to, to somebody else, that's not fair to yourself because no one else has the experiences that Matt Moran has. And no one has the exact same experience that Mary Morantz has as well. Yeah. And you talk in your book about, um, you know, uh, ramps that you would eat uh, for growing up. And uh, then you have them you, you, at a fancy restaurant in uh, New Haven when you're at law school there. And you you talk about how they couldn't compare, uh, yeah. but maybe talk a little bit about what you learned uh, about the roots and uh, what was grown in West Virginia versus what you uh, found in, in New Haven. Oh, I love that question. And I love that you asked specifically about roots. Um, and in the context of comparison, I have actually just this week, as we're talking, released my second book, which is called Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots. And it is in it very much a follow-up to Dirt. The, the two books very much go together. If Dirt is a story about making peace with your past and a love letter to the girl in the trailer, this is very much a love letter to the woman after the trailer, the person after the trailer, and is about not letting your past determine or be a chain around your present. That are you continuing to try to build a beautiful life, a quote-unquote good life, to prove to people how far you've come or to feel safe or to finally feel enough of something? And comparison is a huge part of that. This idea of you feel like you can walk into any room and people can see directly through you to, you know, they see the the girl in the trailer, they smell the dollar store perfume, they smell the uh, mildew preceding you. Um, and, and I think like that whole journey when you put those two books together is about going out into the world only to find your way back home and make peace with the muddy parts of your story that built you. And I would say that I have finally started to arrive at a place where I now value the character traits, the kindness, the grit, the empathy that a hard story gives you. That when I would, if somebody said, listen, you can change your story, snap your fingers, Freaky Friday, just like that. And you can be an easy story person overnight. But in doing so, you will have to let go of the tenacity, the grit, the empathy, the kindness it's given you. I finally reached a point where I think, no. Those things are more valuable to me than getting everything I ever wanted or never having to go through hard times. And so that's a lot of what this new book is about. I can't wait to pick it up. And for the listening audience, definitely pick up Dirt. I've, I really enjoyed that. And I'm looking forward to diving more into um, your, your newest book. Um, you know, the one thing I've learned about from all of my guests, they, I mentioned before we started recording that most of them have, you know, gone through their own fight, hurdle, whatever you want to have it. But each of them talk about how it, that, that, that difficult time strengthened them as a, as a human being. And reality, I, I just think that for those people that had like easy life, mm -hmm. in many senses, they're probably not as resilient as somebody that lived the life that, that you perhaps did. Mm, you know, in Dirt, there's a part where I say I have a very scientific theory, which means it's not scientific at all, um, that we are all born with these hard edges and we're walking around the world bumping up into one another and unintentionally leaving these marks on one another, this death by a thousand cuts, you know, just saying something that is not um, empathetic, that is not, you're not assuming that they might struggle with that or you are failing to see them as important or you you forget to invite them, whatever the case is. And go, I said, going through hard things is like progressively finer grits of sandpaper that round off the hard edges. And in, in going through that, it's very velvet, you know, velveteen rabbit. Um, you become wobbly, your joints become loose, but you have become real and you can never be ugly again to people who understand. So you go through these hard things and in the process, you become a soft place to land for other people. Um, and I, I remember so many times growing up, I had a friend, the Baptist family who she lived in the beautiful house. She got a car when she turned 16, you know, they went school shopping and got the good jeans, whatever it was. 
I would have traded places with her in an instant. And then you, you zoom out and you add in this variable of time and you realize everything you would have missed out on that God has for you simply because you were looking at one tiny little fragment of your life and assuming it was a life sentence. So yes, I think there's just something, you know, really beautiful about saying I've reached a point where who I'm becoming is more important than what I'm getting. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, we touched earlier, your, your, your father for, for years would refer to you as, uh, the kid and, um, and that was until law school. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he started referring to you as Mary, but a number of years later, I can't specifically remember exactly what he did refer to you as the kid again. Mm. What, what did that mean to you? And what was that moment like for you? Yeah. So dirt actually kicks off and it becomes an anchor point throughout the book of scene. We return to you. It kicks off in 2016 in the hospital. And my dad has, um, they've discovered three tumors, uh, colon cancer that had grown into one and he lost like 60 pounds, you know, in just a matter of a couple weeks. Um, and when I walk into, walked into the hotel, into the hospital room, um, he's, he called me kid again. And it had been at that point, it had been years since, cause I went to law school in 2003 and graduated in 2006. This was 2016. So it had been a long time since he called me kid at the point that I went to law school and then I get engaged while I'm in law school and married. Um, so he was trying to, you know, honor me as a, a grown woman to call me by my first name and to see him kind of revert in that moment to calling me the kid again. It, it really, um, worried me because it made me feel like maybe he wasn't in, you know, in the moment in the room that he was slipping away. And, uh, you know, they say like you kind of like scenes of your life flash before your eyes. And I thought maybe that was what was happening. Um, and it sort of kicks off this really powerful, I think, narrative in dirt of me showing up as the girl in the trailer and the girl after. And they feel like these two separate disintegrated versions of myself. I say, you know, that the nurses at the station in the hallway, their accents sounded both foreign and familiar at the same time. Like the two different versions I now held inside me couldn't agree on which one it was. Um, and so we see, you know, the scenes of my life start flashing on the whitewashed walls of the hospital room with the hospital corners sterile and his dark, you know, muddy hands against the white sheets. It kicks off a narrative of in that sterile, sick backdrop, what does it look like for these two versions of me to find one another again? That is beautiful. Yeah. You know, we touched on your father quite a bit, talked about Goldie. I want to come to your mother for a second. Um, your your mother left at nine, but it, mm. the the most beautiful part of the conversation that you had with John O'Leary was when you, in my 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 opinion, was when you talked about um, you know forgiveness mm. and reconciliation and how your mother kind of taught you and, and worked uh, like that relationship really incubated. Um, how you saw the two differently. And maybe if you could share with our listeners, you know, um, more about that. Yeah. So, um, my mom, my mom left when I was nine to go work traveling on the road for her job. She was doing remodel for a, a retail store that doesn't exist anymore. And in the beginning, it was every two weeks, she would be home for two days and I would see her, you know, four days a month. And, that was actually very hard for me. Um, it was hard for me to begin with because I didn't know that she was leaving until the morning she left and she was packing up her suitcase. And when she left and the early pattern was to be back home every two weeks and then leave again, it sort of felt like I was being left over and over again. Um, and then it would be once a month and then once every other month and then, you know, a couple times a year and then once a year. And so there was this just like very gradual departure from my life that was also a repetitive departure from my life so in hindsight looking back and I can't speak to it because I didn't experience it the other way but it almost feels like that was harder um and so when it came time you, there, of course I saw her throughout my life she was at my wedding you know as a as a grown-up and um at my law school graduation things like that but we were not we were not close and 
um, when I sat down to write dirt, I did this whole first draft. It was the first time I'd ever put to paper, words to paper, what had happened in my story. And so and I now know, looking back, that in a lot of ways, that first draft was for me, that before there can be healing, you have to clean out a wound. You have to get that poison out. And so that's sort of what that draft was. It was kind of venom on the page, and it was very honest, but it was very bitter and very angry. And I turned it into my editor, and uh, she had to finish another project for 24 hours. She was working on that. So I didn't hear back from her, and that was all that I needed. Kind of have called it my... Um, Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge moment where you see a future that you are not proud of and you wake up and say, do I still have time to get it right, to, to fix it? And so, you know, is it, is it still Christmas basically? And um, I messaged my editor and I said, we're going to gut it and start over. And so she said, that's fine, but you have two months to the day to do it. And it's got to be, you know, 50,000 words. And so I turned in 50,000. I ended up gutting about 30, 35,000 and the book ended up being 70,000. So 50,000 new words got written in about two months. Um, and in between telling her that and starting the new draft, I ended up doing this three hour phone call with my mom and I got to ask her all these questions I'd never asked before. And I had actually started my podcast a few months before. And so I have the headphones and the microphone and we tell her we're recording and that was such a gift because it was almost like muscle memory kicked in and I got to be more of like a curious journalist, you know, asking curious questions instead of like angry or attacking or judgmental questions. And so I think we were able to cover a lot more ground than we would have otherwise. Um, and in that phone call, she there's a moment where she she breaks down and she starts crying um, in answering the question. I said, I know you want to tell me all these reasons that you left that it was health insurance and, and money and, and reasons like that. But you also left because as you told me many times, you wanted to be more than just junior's wife or Mary's mom. And she said, she started crying and she was like, yeah, there's truth in that. And, um, you know, I basically said to her like, that's okay. Like there's truth in tears and like, I'm still here and you're still here and we still have time and we're still family. And, um, Cheryl Strait is, has the I think the first person who ever said this that when you're writing your story it should go through versions of true, truer, and truest. And so first draft was true, but it becomes truer when I can incorporate things I've learned from having conversations with my dad and my mom. And then truest is what does God have to say about it? That is remarkable. That is remarkable. You know, with a show around gratitude, you've had some individuals in your life that have been very impactful. You talk quite a bit about them in in dirt. Your your father Goldie. When you think about the impact that they've had on your life, what are you most grateful for? Mm. You know, there are studies that talk about if a child, even if that child grows up without a lot, they don't have a lot. If if an, if just one adult will take an interest in them, that can be a teacher or somebody at church or a neighbor or somebody in your family, a grandparent, whatever the case may be, um, then it can just change that the tra the whole trajectory of that child's life. And I feel like I am living, breathing proof of that. Because I had many, you know, adults, my dad, Goldie, um, in her own way, you know, I think my mom told herself a story about I could have more if she could leave and, and send the money back home. Um, teachers, people at church, the, the Baptist family, there were, there were people at every pinnacle point who, had they not taken the interest that they did, my life could have turned out very differently. And so I think if you're listening to this and maybe you don't have a ton and you feel like I can't set my kid up for success because we don't have a ton of money, there's not a huge inheritance. What I would remind you is that a legacy of hard work and work ethic and integrity and character and just taking an interest. Maybe you're not a natural teacher, but you can get them the workbook. You can sit down with the, you know, at the time it was encyclopedias. Now it's, you know, on the computer or the phone or whatever. But just taking that little bit of interest, do not underestimate what that can do to change somebody's entire life. And so that's what I that's what I would say to them is they I say at the end of dirt, most people hear a story like trailer to Yale Law and they get interested in the upward explosion of mobility. But for me, I got interested in the spark that came before and going backwards to make peace with my story changed everything. That is awesome, Mary. That is awesome. As we wrap up, Mary, um, I ask every one of my guests kind of a similar question. I'm going to ask yours a little bit differently just because you did have um, a unique life growing up in 
uh, Nicholas County, West Virginia. Um, tough by by uh, by all accounts. Um, you know, you touched on you know the single wide trailer that you grew up in. Um, we, we, everybody faces different hurdles in life, but I, I I'm a firm believer it's really kind of how you a, a, a attack those hurdles, which really dictates uh, the outcome from that. What, what did growing up in Nicholas County do first and foremost for Mary and who she is today? Mm, I I have to say that it's a work ethic meets an integrity meets a everybody can be your neighbor you know i think west virginians are some of the will literally give you the shirt off their back you know i can remember being little and one of the men who worked for my dad his his their trailer burned down and we packed everything in the car and we took clothes you know that we had to go give them and little stuffed animals and like whatever we could give them like that is the character of the people there you know there is this unshakable spirit that grows wild in the mountains there and the same year my dad got sick 2016 the town of Richwood also had a hundred year flood that destroyed you know wiped the town out and all the experts said the town cannot come back from this it's gonna have to be torn down you know the water's gonna be polluted whatever the case may be and a lot the high school that I graduated from did have to be torn down and you know there were water problems and things like that but that town joined together to start to build back they're building back the sidewalks they're starting new restaurants they're finding ways to bring tourism in and i think that there is this just like appalachian tell me go ahead tell me i can't underestimate me that'll be fun that'll be really fun <laughs> and man has that served me well you know all of that has served me well and um i think just the time that i grew up in and the place that i grew up in i'm not sure that particular combination of, um, you know, just, just grit. I mean, I think every generation has their own version of it for sure, but, uh, growing up analog and having to find ways to entertain ourselves and, you know, just growing up where we did, I think there is this just creativity and this commitment to excellence and this work ethic that I would never be where I am today if I didn't start where I was. Well, thanks so much for sharing your story with our listening audience today. Uh, you know, for those that are perhaps doubting what they're capable of doing, I pick up the book, Dirt. Uh, you will see how grit, determination, work ethic, uh, faith can do for one. Uh, Mary, you're, you're inspiring your audience to live to their fullest. Um, and such a great, great honor to, to connect with you today. Um, having two girls myself, it was just so beautiful to see the impact that your father had on you and uh, just amazing relationships that you shared in, in, the, in the book, Dirt. And I can't wait to pick up the, the, the newest version. Um, so thanks so much, Mary, for being on. Listening audience, as, as we wrap up, I, I've, I touched on this before, but uh, we all face hurdles. And three things I think about doing each and every day to to best address the hurdles that are in front of me is first and foremost, find the courage to be grateful, regardless of how powerful that storm is. Secondly, be present to those that you're truly with. You'd be amazed at the gifts that are right in front of you if you just are present to those that you're with. And lastly, pay attention to how you're feeding your mind, body, and soul. Today's guest is Mary Morantz, the author of Dirt. If today's conversation inspired you in some way, shape, or form, please subscribe to the show, comment on it, and share it with others. With gratitude, Matt listeners, until next time, find the courage to be grateful. Godspeed, my friends.